I'm talking about Mac versus iOS. Because I get asked this question a lot, usually from folks who are sort of starting out and they're like, Pete, I'm going to invest. I'm going to set myself up a studio. Do I buy a MacBook and then plug everything in and use that with GarageBand? Or do I buy an iPad and plug everything else in and use that with GarageBand? Well, like most things in life, the answer is a big fat it depends. It depends on your workflow. It depends on how portable you want to be. And it depends on the sort of music you're creating and what you want to be able to do. So what I thought I would break down here is the six differences between GarageBand Mac and GarageBand iOS. The, the, the key features, I guess. So I thought by going through the key features that are available in one that aren't available in the other, it might help you make your decision easier about which one you should be using. So let's start with our friends on the Mac side. What does GarageBand Mac have that iOS doesn't? Uh, yeah, let's, let's not bury the lead. It has a master track. So you can do things on the master track. You can adjust your master volume. You've got a master fader. That is something that we simply don't have in GarageBand iOS, and it frustrates me kind of on the daily. There's workarounds, there's hacks, there's ways to get around it, which I show on the channel. Plenty of tutorials showing you how to do that. But yes, I must admit, I would love to see myself a master track on GarageBand iOS. Number two, automation. GarageBand iOS has volume automation. It doesn't have panning automation. It doesn't have effect automation. So GarageBand Mac has all those things. It allows you to automate your panning, to get an automated pan effect, to automate your chorus and your reverb and your delay by selecting those in your automation track. Number three, the display. So one of the biggest frustrations with GarageBand iOS is you can't really change how it looks and how it's displayed. Biggest issue being the time display. Yes. You'd think it would be a simple, simple thing, and hopefully we'll get it in the future. But if what you're recording and what you're doing is important to know how long it is, you're recording a podcast, you're recording videos and overdubs and things, having a time display would be kind of handy. And just knowing that your song is four minutes, not having to work out that it's 112 bars at BPM 90 in 4-4 time and then having to work backwards from that. Uh, the next one, auto normalization control. Yeah, so auto normalization control means that in GarageBand for Mac, when you're exporting your final mix, you can actually tell it, I don't want you to auto normalize. What auto normalization does, and it's on by default in GarageBand iOS, is it automatically lifts your volume to zero dB. Now you might be thinking, Pete, that's cool. That means if I'm under zero dB, it'll automatically mix it up and make it louder. That's got to be better for sharing, right? Well, yes. But no, yes, it's better if you just want to export, send to someone and be done. Put a fork in it, it's done. But if you want to master, it makes it additionally tricky because when you're mastering, you need what's called headroom. So you don't actually want it up at zero dB. You want it left down at about minus 12, minus 10, at least minus 6 dB. Give yourself a little bit of room. So if you're adding in some limiting or some compression or some other EQ moves, that it's not going to start really pushing up against it. So auto normalization control, Mac for the win. Um, USB compatibility is kind of the last thing I'll say here. And that is that you can plug and play pretty much any USB device, including ones that aren't necessarily class compliant. The reason being that you can install drivers on a Mac if you need to, to get some more sort of high-end features of some of your USB devices. So if you've got uh, if you've got an audio interface with like DSP, with digital signal processing, where you can record through reverb or effects or delays and things, well, that's not going to work in iOS because if you need drivers to install, software to install, guess what? Can't do that on iOS, but you can generally do that on a Mac. Let's flip over and talk iOS because you might be thinking at this point, Whew, why would I ever use iOS? Mac sounds like it's got so many killer features that iOS doesn't have. Well, not really because there's some cool things that iOS does that Mac doesn't. Number one being merge tracks. So the merge tracks feature in iOS is super, super handy. So if you've got one, two, seven, 20 tracks in GarageBand iOS, you wanna mix them down to a stereo track, but leave it right there in your project. You just select those suckers, you hit the merge button and boom, it mixes those down, normalizes them. You can still turn the volume down, but normalizes them and they're there good to go. Unfortunately, in GarageBand Mac, to do the same thing, you would have to select all the tracks, solo them, then actually render out, actually export that track 
as a WAV file, then bring that WAV file back in, then delete out any of the tracks that you've merged down. So it's about a three or four step process on a Mac and there's no other way to do it on a Mac apart from doing that. So that's one area where GarageBand iOS has a very, very handy, very, very handy feature with the merge. Number two, Alchemy Synth. So GarageBand iOS has all the Alchemy Synth instruments that you could, well, ever want. Uh, maybe not ever want, but it has a heap of Alchemy Synth instruments. Now, Alchemy is available in Logic, the big brother, big sister of GarageBand on Mac, but it's not available on GarageBand Mac. So if you want yourself some Alchemy Synth and some really heavily customizable, really cool sounding synth sounds, if you're making electronic music in particular, GarageBand iOS is going to deliver all of those for free. Don't forget, both of these are 100% free. So you're comparing apples with apples when it comes to the price. But if you want Alchemy Synth, you'll need GarageBand iOS. Uh, next is the sound library packs that you get. Now, there have been a few additions in GarageBand Mac, but about every three months, a new sound library pack is dropping for a GarageBand iOS. So in recent times, we've had things like the Flex and Flow. We've had the Disco Pack. I forgot its name. Uh, we've had a bunch of um, Lo-Fi and R&B packs all drop about once every three months. So we've now got so many Apple Loops, so many synth, so many alchemy sounds because we've got all these new packs that have been added. So it's really expanded your ability to create music. Once again, especially if you're creating electronic music, it makes it a lot better. Speaking of electronic music, the live loops feature. Now this is something that again has recently come to Logic on the Mac but is not available in GarageBand iOS. The ability to, uh, sorry, GarageBand Mac, the ability to use your grid and your touch screen to actually do that. And I've probably buried the lead that the touch instruments are probably another thing that I didn't even put in my list here. But while we're talking live loops, the ability to trigger things just with your screen, not needing an external MIDI controller, not needing an external keyboard, just being able to use the screen to play your keys, to play your guitars, to control your synths, synth instruments is very, very cool and to be able to use live loops. Now, the, the, the final thing here is that there is an adapter required. So as I've spoken about a bunch of times here on the channel, you do need the Lightning to USB adapter. If you're using a Lightning-based iPhone or iPad, you do need to plug in using that genuine Apple adapter. That's going to set you back anywhere between $40 and $65, depending where in the world you are. But it is, it's a one-time purchase, and then you can plug in all your USB microphones, keyboards, audio interfaces, etc., and you're good to go. And as we mentioned before, you can't then install drivers to run your uh, other uh, apps or your other software or some the hardware that may need some additional drivers to run. So there you go. Yeah, you can weigh up the options there. Perfect world is if you're going to have a computer and an iPhone or an iPad, have both. And in fact, if you do have both, the final thing I'll mention here is compatibility. And that is this. You can go from iOS to Mac. You can't go from Mac back to iOS. So if you are using both or if you're collaborating with someone and you're a cross-platform, keep that in mind. As soon as it's saved out in a Mac format, that's it. It's not going back to iOS. You'll have to export WAV files, bring them in, use some stems, do some other things like that. So I hope you found this useful, but my question to you is, what other differences are there? What are your favorite features or what you find missing from the Mac or the iOS version? Or what did I miss in terms of what's different about the two platforms? Love you to let me know.